Okay, good. A little bit of enthusiasm, if you will. It's great to be here this evening, and a good evening to our viewing audience as well. Look at this. I brought like a veritable library with me tonight. Yeah? A little bit of light reading, 900 pages. I'll be showing you that in just a bit. Did you have a good day today? Oh, man, I had a really good day today. Had a run, spent some time with uh, Dr. Stefanovich, went over and played dodgeball with the kids at the school. Got totally humbled. Totally humbled. I thought I would just absolutely win, and, and uh, no, no, such was not the case. So anyway, I've had a great day, very busy day, and we have quite a little bit of information that we're going to cover. We're talking about the unknown God, and last night we sort of set the table. Were you with us last night? Okay. Last night we sort of set the table. Tonight we're going to continue to sort of put the meal on the table as we seek to understand who and what, in as much as we can understand, is this God that is revealed to us in Scripture. And so without further ado, we're just going to have a quick prayer and we're going to dive right into our time together in Scripture. Father in heaven, what a privilege to be here tonight. And as John has sung, it is true that you paid a very high price, the highest possible price, uh, the price of your own life, the life of your Son, the life of God. And Father, it is our privilege tonight to come before you because of what Jesus has done. We don't come in our own merits or our own righteousness, for we have none. We possess nothing. As the old hymn says, nothing in our hands we bring, simply to thy cross we cling. And so, Father, we thank You for being willing to pay that price. And tonight, as we seek to understand who You are and what You are and why You would do this, this amazing thing, this gospel story, Father, I pray that Your Spirit would come into this room, yes, uh, but Father, more than that, we pray that Your Spirit would come into our hearts, that we may understand who You are and and the significance and the height and the depth and the breadth of Your love and grace. Um, be with us, Father, tonight. May the unknown God, the Spirit, um, become less unknown. May we seek to understand Him better and to know Him better and thus to know You better. Bind our hearts together with You and with one another tonight as we open Scripture is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone give an enthusiastic all right. Amen. Very good. Now, let's just spend a couple minutes in review talking about what we did last night, what we learned last night, and then we are going to continue with our discussion of the singularity and the plurality of God, okay? So, I'm going to ask a simple question here. How many gods are there in Scripture? The true gods. How many true gods are there in Scripture? One God, okay? And that would be an emphasis on the singularity of God, right? But as we began to learn last night, God is manifested in three persons or in a plurality, and that's what we're going to be discussing uh, tonight and even tomorrow night as well, trying to get our minds and our hands wrapped around this idea of God as one and yet God as three. And what's the word that's sometimes used to describe that? The word Trinity. Now, is the word Trinity, are we married to that word? Is it essential that you use that word? No, there are certain teachings that are not in harmony with Scripture um, that someone might call Trinitarian. And so if someone says, oh, David, but I saw this really weird, really wild, really crazy thing on the Trinity online, and they bring that definition to you or to me, if it's a little wild and a little weird and a little crazy and it's not biblical, are we going to say, oh, I believe that because it says Trinity? No, we're going to say, in as much as we're allowed to define that term, that's what we believe. And that's what we're trying to understand is what does that mean? Why did this word even come up? Why, why the idea that God is a singularity and as well as a plurality? Now, one more little thing that we learned last night, and that is that when we're seeking to understand who and what God is, and we looked at several passages last night, we looked at Psalms, we looked at Job, we looked at Deuteronomy, and we looked at the New Testament, 1 Timothy 3.16, God in the essence of His Godness is easy or difficult to understand. You tell me. Do we, do we understand God exhaustively? No, 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 no. We understand just the smallest little sliver of who and what God is. Who remembers what our illustration was last night? What is this here? This is the, this is the seashore, and out there is the sea. All of this that's behind us is the very uh, limits of, 
of human intellect and human language, and we say all of the correct things in the best possible way, and we're thinking correctly, but even in our best thinking and even in our best articulation, the reality that is God is an infinity beyond. Are we clear on that, everyone? God cannot be boxed in or circumscribed by our language. Now, God does reveal Himself in Scripture. He does use words, but we have to understand and appreciate the limits of those words and the limits of the human intellect. Amen? As we, as we heard last night, that, uh, one of the questions that was uh, put there in the book of Job is, can you search the limits of God? And the answer is, uh, of course not. Paul in the New Testament says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, what we're going to try and do this evening is continue to understand this wonderful, beautiful mystery that is God as a unity, singularity, as well as a plurality. Now, the title of our whole series is Unknown God, and we're seeking to understand the role and person of the Holy Spirit. But before we can really get to understand who and what and the work of the Spirit is, we have to understand what is God in His nature and in His character, and that's what we began to do last night. So that's a little bit of review. Are you ready for some new material now? Okay. Now, we started in Genesis chapter 1, right at the very beginning, in a good systematic treatment of who God is and how He reveals Himself. And we came across that important passage there in chapter 1, and it says God, that God said, let us make man in our image. And who remembers the analogy that we used last night, the, the, the illustration? What is this? This is a mirror, and when I look in the mirror, is that me there? Is that me? What is that? That's a reflection or an image. And so, while that is not me, that is certainly, certainly an accurate representation of me. In other words, it would be a little strange to look in the mirror and see curly hair and glasses, and then to look at me and see bald and no glasses, right? That'd be that you would say, oh, that's strange. Or to look there and, and see a woman, and to look here and see a man, right? You'd say, well, that's something, the mirror is broken, yeah. right? <laughs> okay, so when we look at the thing that God made in His image, what is that thing that God made in His image? Oh, very good. A family. Let us make man in our image, plural possessive pronoun. Let them. Them as a plural represents a plural, an us and an our. The very first thing that God says to the man and the woman, both of whom were made in His image, is make another. And so the thing that in its most uh, sublime uh, uh, beauty that is in the image of God is not just a male or just a female, but the family unit is the thing that is truly in the image of God. We're going to unpack that further as we continue now. Um, Genesis chapter 3, we noted that verse yesterday, man has become like one of us, right? Man has become like one of us, Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. Now what we're going to do is go to Genesis chapter 11. This is now new material. Genesis chapter 11, this is the story. Well, who knows what story this is? What's right there in Genesis chapter 11 just after the flood? A little bit of a building project. Okay, very good. The Tower of Babel. And uh, let's just read through this because there's uh, two interesting things that emerge here, two very important things. We'll pick it up in verse 1. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, these are the people after the flood, now watch this language here, come let, what does your Bible say? Come let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for, asphalt for mortar. And they said, here's our phrase again, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built, and the Lord said, indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Now, let's just pause here for a moment. The story is basically being told of a people who are going to build a city and build a tower, and this refrain occurs three times. Come let, come let, come let. So people here are unified, and they're going to do a thing. 
But watch this very interesting what Moses does here. Under the inspiration of the Spirit, Moses keeps this same refrain, but notice that he changes the subject of the refrain. Now it's somebody else who's giving the very same phrase. Notice verse 7. Come let... What does your Bible say? Come let us go down there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Who is the come let us in verse 7? It's God Himself. Okay, so don't miss that. Don't miss that very fascinating little stylistic element where Moses says that the, the people say three times, come let us do something, come let us do something, come let us do something. And Moses says that God then said, come let us. God here is referred to by Himself as a plural. God refers to Himself in the plural. We've talked about a little bit about why this is. It's because the word there in the Hebrew is the word Elohim, which is in the plural. Now, there's another very fascinating thing here. Look back at verse 6. Look back at verse 6. It says, And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one. Now, I'm going to ask a very simple question. People, is that a single unit? Is that a single individual? Or is that a plural? Okay, so check this out. The people, plural, are, what does the Bible say? One. The people are one. Now, yesterday I told you there's a word. You might not remember it, but it says that, that when the man and the woman become one flesh, that that word is the word ikad. You remember that? The word ikad. Not the word yakid, which is a different word, which means solitary, alone, completely alone. The word ikad means not just one, but unity, unity. That's the very same word that we have here in verse 6. Indeed, the people, that is a plural entity, a plurality, are ikad. The man and the woman, two, are ikad. Now, that's going to become very important for us in just a moment because we're going to look at one of the most significant, arguably the single most sacred text to Jewish persons in the entire Old Testament. We're going to look at what, what the Jews call the Shema, which means hear or to listen. We're going to go there in just a moment. But at this point, I just want you to put this idea on a shelf in your mind that a plural can be one, and that's not necessarily inherently contradictory. Are we together on that, everyone? Because the man and the woman became one, and here the people are what? The people are one. Now, you're in Genesis 11. Go to Genesis 18. Now, under normal circumstances, if we had more time, we would just read the whole story of Genesis chapter 18. We just read it through, but I'm just going to quickly rehearse it for you. A man by the name of Abraham. What's his name, everyone? A man by the name of Abraham is sitting in uh, the door of his tent under the trees, and he looks out, and as Abraham looks out, he sees three travelers. How many travelers does he see? three travelers, and in keeping with Middle Eastern custom, he rushes out to meet the three travelers, and he invites them to his place. Hey, come, wash your feet, have a meal, get some water. And so the three travelers come to Abraham's tent there under the oaks, I think it was at a place called Mamre, and they sit down, and they begin to interact. They're talking, they're conversing. Now, Abraham thinks that he's just invited three travelers, three sojourners that are just making their way. He doesn't know that who he is actually invited in is God himself and two angels. He doesn't know this because they just look like ordinary travelers. Now, in the course of their, their time that's spent together, um, they talk and they eat some food, and then they say, okay, well, we've got to get going. Okay, we've got to get going. And so they say to Abraham, we're going to go. And so Abraham, the Bible says, sees them out. Right? We do that, don't we? When people come to our house and they get up to leave, do we just say, okay, see you? Do we see them to the door? Yeah, yeah. In some families, you say bye to them in the living room, then you say bye at the door, then you say bye outside of the door, then you say bye at the car, and then you wave, right? It's like a series of goodbyes. So that's kind of what Abraham's doing here. He's had lunch with the three, he's had, had a meal with them, and then he sees them out, and as he's seeing them out, God says, and this is right toward the end of Genesis 18, God says, am I going to withhold this thing that I'm going to do from Abraham, seeing that Abraham is my guy and I know that he will command his household after him? Can I withhold from Abraham what I'm about to do? And as Abraham is seeing them out, God is thinking this, and then God turns to Abraham, and the other two, the Bible says, continue to walk. God turns, and He says to Abraham, Abraham, let me tell you what we're doing here. 
there is a cry that has come up to us, a great cry from a certain city, a pair of cities. What, what were those two cities? Sodom. Sodom. We have heard a great cry has come up to us, and we're going down to see if, in fact, it is as we have heard. Right? We find this many times in Scripture. In Genesis chapter 3, God comes down to see what Adam has done. In Genesis chapter 11, He goes down to see the tower that the sons of men had built. We just saw that. And here in Genesis 18, He turns and He says to Abraham, we're, we're going to Sodom and Gomorrah to see if it's as we've heard. And if it is, those cities are going to be destroyed. Now, Abraham is immediately concerned because he knows somebody who lives in one of those cities. And who is that? Lot. Lot. Okay, so now... Abraham says to God, and this is at the point where he realizes, whoa, these are not just ordinary travelers. These are not just ordinary sojourners. This is the, in fact, he calls him the judge of all the earth. He says that to him. He says, what? You're going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because Abraham knows what kind of a city it is, okay? And so he says, what? Will not the judge of all the earth do the right thing, right? You're familiar with this? And he says, what if there were 50 righteous there? And God says, does anyone know what he says? He says, well, if there were 50 righteous, I would what? I would preserve it. And then Abraham says, but what if there were 45? God says, I would preserve it. What if there were 40? I would preserve it. What if there were 30? What if there were 20? What if there were 10? All the way down. They're bargaining down to 10. And God says, hey, if there were 10, I would preserve it. Now, this is just how Genesis 18 ends. And let me just walk you through that. Go to Genesis chapter 18. Let's just read the last little bit there. We'll pick it up in verse 31, last three verses. And, in, and he said, indeed, now I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. So he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. And he said, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. Now look at verse 33. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. The word Lord there is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's Jehovah. Okay, so Abraham has just been talking face to face with, with God, right, with, the, with, with who he calls the judge of all the earth. And then after this conversation is done, remember that there's no breaks in, in the way that Genesis was written. In fact, the way that the whole Bible was written, the chapterization, the versification was added many, many centuries later. In fact, millennia later in this case. So now look at the very next thing that we read, 19 verse 1. It says, now the two, what does your Bible say? Now the two, well, who are the two angels? Oh, simple. They're the ones that were, how many people had, had lunch with Abraham? Three. Three. And one turned to talk, that was God, and the two angels made their way to where? They made their way to Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know the story, right? They show up and they, they meet Lot, and Lot says, hey, come stay at my place. No, we'll just sleep in the square. No, you're going to stay at my place. He brings them over. Do we know the story? Now, you might be saying, what does this have to do with the unknown God? What does this have? Ah, now this is a very interesting point. We went through all of that little story in Genesis 18 and 19 to establish a very simple fact, and that is that God, Jehovah, Yahweh, okay, God, who everyone? God is on the earth. Are you with me on that? He's on the earth. We know that because he was just eating cheese in Abraham's tent, Okay? Here's what it says. He's, he's on the earth. He was just talking to Abraham. After that conversation is done, he begins to walk and starts to catch up to the angels that have gone ahead. We together, everyone? Well, as the angels arrive there, they stay at Lot's house. You know the story that the wicked peoples of Sodom and Gomorrah, particularly Sodom in this case, they come out and they say, hey, we want these guys. They're blinded, and they basically say, hey, Lot, let me tell you what's up. We're not just ordinary travelers. We're here to find out if what we've heard about this city is true. We've seen that it's the case. This city is going to be destroyed. Get your family and get out, right? I'm telling you a very uh, a story, a very familiar story that you would know. Now, watch this. As the angels lay hold on Lot and his wife, begins to drag them and the family out, a very interesting thing happens. I'm in Genesis 19 now. Let's pick it up in verse 19. Indeed, now your servant has found favor in your sight, and you have increased your mercy, which you have shown me by saving my life. But I cannot escape to the mountains, lest some evil overtake me and I die. The angels had said, run to the mountains. And he's like, ah, I don't really like camping. I don't want to, I can't go to the mountains. I mean, I don't even, where do I sleep? I don't have a sleeping bag. I don't have a tent. So he says, I can't do that. Verse 20, see now, he says, oh, there's a city over here, just a little one, just a small city, a little near enough to flee to. It's just a small one. Please let me escape there. Is it not just a little one? And my soul will live. Verse 21, and he said to him, see, I have favored you concerning this thing also, and that I will not overthrow this city for which you have spoken. 
Lot was apparently a bit of a city boy, right? And so he says, I can't go camping. I want to go to the city. Okay, then go to Zoar. Verse 22, hurry, escape there, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. Therefore, the name of the city was called Zoar, which means little um, or insignificant. Now, verse 23, the sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Now, just stop right there. I want to get the, the, the story very simply in our mind. Lot has come out of the city, right? And the angels have said, run away. Run away to the hills. Well, I don't want to go to the hills. Well, then can I go to this little city? Can I go to Zoar? Go to Zoar because I can't do what I'm going to do until you get there. And so it says that Lot makes his way to Zoar. Now watch what happens as God, who had been talking to Abraham, has now apparently arrived at the scene. The ver- he is now at the scene as well. And one of the most intriguing verses in all of Genesis occurs in verse 24. Okay, and you'll understand why we went through this whole story to establish this. Look at Genesis chapter 19, verse 24. It says, then the Lord, that's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's Yahweh. That's the God of the Old Testament. Then Yahweh rained brimstone and fire on what two cities? Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. Now watch this. From the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, from the Lord, Yahweh, out of the heavens. Now look at that verse again. <laughs> then Yahweh rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh out of the heavens. I want to ask you a simple question. How many Yahwehs you have in that verse? You got two Yahwehs in that verse, don't you? You have two, do you see it? You have two lords in that verse. Now you might be saying, well, wait a minute, how do we know there's two lords there? Very simple. Because one of those lords was just eating cheese in Abraham's tent and then discussing Abraham, the destruction of Sodom and how many people would need to be there in order for him to preserve it. He then turns, and the point of this is to let you know that God's feet are on earth. He's with Abraham. Are you with me? Yes or no? So when he finally shows up and Lot has made his way to Zoar, it says, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord rained brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of the heavens. Question, what direction does rain fall, g- come from? It, no, rain doesn't go up. Not where, Maybe it does here. Rain comes from up, but it comes down. Are you with me on that? I misunderstood what you're saying. Rain comes down. So you have Jehovah there, Yahweh there, right, who is having fire and brimstone come down. So He calls to him, bring it down. you got two Jehovah's in that verse, two Yahweh's in that verse. I'm using those names interchangeably because we don't know exactly what the correct pronunciation is. Okay? Now, the point is basically this. We might read that and think, whoa. I remember one time I studied this with a Jehovah's Witness. Just went through the story with a Jehovah's Witness on the airplane. And he's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And we get down to verse 24. He's like, I got to study that out, he says. I got to study that out. I said, you do that. You study it out. The point is basically this. This is not some radical, strange, weird thing when we follow the basic directionality that Genesis has us headed in. In Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our image. In Genesis chapter 3, man has become like one of us. In Genesis chapter 11, come let us go down and confuse the language. Here in Genesis 18, the Lord is having lunch with Abraham, and then the Lord calls down fire and brimstone from the Lord out of the heavens. What we're seeing here is a common thread of hints. What word did I say, everyone? Hints. Now, do these passages prove that God is a trinity? No, they don't prove that God is a trinity, but what they do is very interesting. They get us headed in a direction that when we get to the New Testament, it becomes crystal clear. If all you had were the Old Testament, let's just imagine that that we don't, the New Testament does not exist, and all we have is the Old Testament, so we're Jews, let's just say. If all you had was the Old Testament, I'm going to go on record as saying you would not emerge from a study of the Old Testament as a Trinitarian. You wouldn't. That's why the the, the Jews are not Trinitarian. If all you had was the Old Testament, what you could say is that there are hints and suggestions that point in the direction of the plurality of God, but you would not say, oh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what is hinted at and what is suggested and what is directional in the Old Testament becomes explicitly clear in the New Testament. Are you with me on that? Now, I want to show you just a couple more things here that I find very interesting in the Old Testament. Just a couple. Um, Go with me to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. We leave Genesis through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers chapter 6. 
Now, this is another passage that I find intriguing, not as proof, but as suggestive. What's the word that I use there, everyone? Suggestive. I want to be very clear on that word. It's suggestive. It's not definitive. It's not definitive. It's suggestive. Now, look at this. In Numbers chapter 6, this is God speaking to Moses, and He says to Moses, Moses, when the priests put my blessing and my name on the people of Israel, they need to do it in a certain way. And when they do it in that certain way, they have to do it just like this. Okay, now you'll be familiar with this blessing. Verse 22, Numbers chapter 6, verse 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, God is very particular. This is how you do it. And watch how the blessing is to be pronounced, the official priestly benediction from God on His people through the priests. Verse 24, Yahweh bless you and keep you. 25, Yahweh make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Verse 26, Yahweh lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Verse 27, so they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. Now, isn't it interesting that the official priestly blessing and benediction that God gives to to Moses to give to the people is a threefold blessing? Yahweh do this, Yahweh do this, Yahweh do this. Now, does this prove the Trinity? Not at all. Does it prove the triune nature of God? Not at all. But it's suggestive particularly when we get to the New Testament and Jesus begins to say very radical things like, I and my Father are one, right? So the official priestly benediction is a threefold blessing. Let me show you another one of those. Go with me to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah has wandered into the temple. I don't know if he wandered there or not, but he's made his way to the temple And as he goes into the temple, he sees the Lord of hosts. And as he sees the Lord of hosts high and lifted up, he sees these angels that are flying around that have three pairs of wings. And with two, they cover their feet. And with two, they cover their face. And with two, they fly. And these angels are crying out something. Oh, what are they crying out? What is it? What is it? Not holy one time. Not holy, holy two times. They're crying out what? Holy, holy, holy holy, which raises the question, why three? Why is the the number of holies that the angels cry out three? It's the very same thing that we find in Revelation chapter 4 verse 8, holy, holy, holy. Now, does this again prove the Trinity? No, it's not proof, it's not determinative, but it's suggestive. Now, in this very passage, there's something else quite interesting. It says here in verse uh, 7, we'll pick it up in verse 7, he touched my mouth with this coal and he said, behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Who will go for us? The holy, holy, holy Lord of hosts in this very same passage refers to himself as an us. Are we beginning to see a bit of a pattern here? God referring to Himself with plural pronouns, God referring to Himself as Elohim in the plural, Yahweh bless you and keep you, Yahweh make His face to shine upon you, Yahweh be gracious unto you, Jehovah rain fire and brimstone from Jehovah out of the heavens. Are we beginning to see a bit of a pattern here? Yes or no? Stay in Isaiah, look at chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, and then I think this will be our final text in the Old Testament, we'll get into the New Testament. Now we'll look at one more in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it's the one I told you we'd look at there, the the most sacred text to a Jewish person, the Shema. But before we do that, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, look at this one. You'll know this one, the Christmas season has just passed here not too long ago, and this is a passage that uh, we often associate with the Christmas season. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, that's very interesting. The Son is called Mighty God. The Son is called Everlasting Father. Now, sometimes that throws people off. They say, what? How is He the Son and He's the Father? Well, He's the Father in this sense. In this particular sense, He is the Father of the human race, the new Father of the human race. Adam, of course, was the first Father. He failed. But Jesus, in a very special sense, Paul refers to Him in the New Testament as the second Adam. 
right? He's the new father of the human race. That's why we have to be born again. We were born the first time under the old Adam, and we're born again under the new Adam. Can you say amen to that? So here's a very interesting thing. Think about this. If you have a horse, right, what is the, I don't know if this is the correct language, the son of a horse is what kind of an animal? I know that's really bad. I don't know anything about horses. Full, okay, but, but what kind of an animal is it? Is it a chicken? It's a horse. Okay, so let me make it very simple. Horse, horse. If you have progeny, if you have descendants from a horse, it's a horse. If you have a pig, you have a pig. If you have a fish, you have a fish. If you have a human, you have a human, right? So think this through. If the Son is mighty God, what's the Father? He's God. He's God too. So if the Son is God and the Father is God, then how many Yahwehs do you have there? You have two. So what we see here is very fascinating. In the Old Testament, we don't have proof positive that God is in fact a plurality in terms of a triunity, but we do see suggestions. We see, what's the word, everyone? <laughs> suggestions that hint in that direction. Now what we're going to do is we're going to transition to the final passage. This is the one I was mentioning there, Deuteronomy 6. And if you were to ask one of your uh, Jewish friends, what is the essence of the Old Testament? What is the most important, most central, most sacred verse in the Old Testament? They would almost certainly take you to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, referred to by the Jews as the Shema, the Shema, which means listen, hear. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God the Lord is, what does your Bible say? One. one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, now, what this actually says in the Hebrew is Jehovah or Yahweh, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh is the, the appropriate uh, uh, personal name of God. Again, we don't know if that's the exact right uh, uh, voweling, but Yahweh, Elohim, Yahweh Echad. Okay, now let me unpack that for you there. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Jehovah or Yahweh, Elohim, remember that's our term for the plural, that's a plural word for God. Again, Jehovah, Echad. Yahweh, Elohim, Yahweh, Echad is exactly what that verse is saying. Now here's an interesting thing. We've already seen how the word Echad is used in Hebrew thinking. The two become Echad. That's Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis 11, with the building of the Tower of Babel, behold, the people, many, are ikad, one. And so here when it says Jehovah is ikad, it doesn't mean Je Jehovah is a rigid singularity. The word for that would be yakid. That would be the word. In fact, I think I've got an interesting little thing here. Let me just read this to you. Very interesting, great little book here. It's actually not particularly little, but it's... Uh, a book called The Trinity, Understanding God's Love, His Plan of Salvation, and Christian Relationships by Woodrow Whidden, Jerry Moon, John W. Reeve. Love this book. Great introduction to the subject. Let me just read you a very um, short statement here on this, on this particular word, ikad. The authors write, what is striking about this important word translated as one in English is that it is the Hebrew word ikad. It means one among others, the emphasis being on a particular one. The possibility of there being others is inherent in Ikad, but Yaqid precludes that possibility. Another way to explain Ikad is that it refers to the oneness that results from a unity of numerous persons. Now, Moses most certainly had the Hebrew word yakid, which he could have employed if he wanted to describe the Lord God of Israel as an exclusively unitary being. He does not say Yahweh is yakid, one in the solitary sense. He says Yahweh is ikad, one in the unified sense, in the same sense that a man and a woman are one family, one flesh, in the same sense that the people are unified in language, they are unified in purpose. This is why, as Christians, we affirm this glorious, wonderful, sublime, and yet mysterious truth that God is one, but He is three persons that comprise one God. 
Now, that's sort of the Old Testament. That gets us headed in a direction. We transition now to the New Testament. We're going to look at several passages in the New Testament that strongly suggest what is implicit in the Old Testament becomes increasingly explicit in the New Testament. And we run into so many passages in which, in which God is very explicitly, I would say, communicating not just plurality, but now triunity. Not just two, but, but three. And one of them is Matthew chapter 3. Join me there if you would. Matthew chapter 3, this is the story of the baptism of Jesus. And in the story of the baptism of Jesus, we encounter all three members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll pick it up in verse 14, John, or Matthew chapter 3, verse 14. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, he is Jesus, so there's one. Jesus came up immediately from the water. Behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God, there's a second entity, descending like a dove up on, and alighting upon him. Verse 17, and suddenly a voice came from where? Heaven. Okay, question, where is Jesus at this point? He's standing in the muddy waters of the River Jordan, right? And so the voice comes from heaven, this is my beloved, what? Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is a, an unambiguous triadic reference, a triadic reference. Do we see the Son here? Yes or no? Do we see the Father here? Do we see the Spirit here? So we see Father, we see Son, and we see Spirit. Again, what's implicit in the Old Testament becomes explicit in the New Testament. Now stay in Matthew, go to chapter 28. From the beginning of Matthew, by the way, it's very interesting. This is something that just occurred to me recently. In Jesus' baptism, all three are present. He's present, His Father is present, and the Spirit is present. When Jesus gives the command, this is so awesome, I can't believe I, I this was literally staring me at the, in the face for years. This is just the, one of the great things about Bible study. You read it, and you read it, and you read it, and you read it, and one day you wake up, you read it a, 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 in a new way, and you think, how did I not see that before? But as the gospel of Matthew comes to a close, and God gives command to the disciples to go baptize, guess who shows up? All three, right? Look at this. Matthew chapter 28, and verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. What's the next word? baptizing them. So there's the context, baptizing them in the name. And by the way, I just was sitting just today right over here in the, uh, the housing for 3ABN with my good friend, Dr. Ronko Stefanovich, who's getting ready to do a live program on this, which is going to be absolutely awesome. And he showed it to me right in the Greek. He said, David, look at this. This is not names, plural. It's name, singular. Baptize them in the name, singular, but watch this, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, there are several things that we need to note here. The first one is very fascinating, and that is this. There's a single name which argues for the singularity of God. Amen? There's only one God. But in that single name, there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, what is clear in the English is super-duper clear, super-duper-duper duper clear, right? That's the, that's the theological term, super-duper-duper. Duper. <laughs> because in the Greek, it's, it's literally and the. Everyone is preceded by the definite article, and the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit. Now, the fascinating thing is that just as in the Greek as also in the English, when you have a list of things that are preceded by the definite article, in the English that would be the, right? In the Greek it's uh, 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 to, to. When, when you have a, a list of things, whether it's two or three or more, it is usually always the case, it's almost always the case that the things that are being described are the same kind of thing. Let me give you an example. Peter, James, and John. That's a list of three. Peter, James, and John, they're all people. It's not Peter, James, and horse. Okay? It's not Peter, James, and fruit smoothie. 
okay? It's the same kind of thing. Here's another one. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They're the, the same kind of thing. They're all gifts. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. So, when, when you have things that are set off in this list fashion, especially when they are, are preceded by the definite article, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, you're dealing with the same kind of thing. Now, I have a question. Is the Father a person? Yeah, of course, of course. He's a, he's a personal being. Is the Son a personal being? Well, guess what the Spirit is then? A personal being. And we're going to unpack that in even greater detail tomorrow, in our session tomorrow. But the point is basically this. In the baptism of Jesus, Jesus is being baptized. There's one. The Father's voice comes. This is my beloved Son. There's two. And the Spirit descends. How many is that? Three. In the context of the baptism, you go all the way through the Gospel of Matthew. And when Jesus gives the command to the disciples for them to go baptize, He says, baptize in the name, singular, of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The three show up again in the context of baptism. Are you with me on that? Now, from the Gospel of Matthew, we go to the Gospel of John, and this is a passage that you'll just, most of you will just know very quickly. If you don't know it, don't feel bad, but many of you will just, if I began quoting this passage, you could easily finish it for many of you. It goes like this, John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, now, just do the math there, okay? Just think this through. In the beginning was the... Okay, so here's, here's we'll just use our books here as an as a, um, illustration. In the beginning was the Word, that's an entity, right? And the Word was with, which communicates adjacency, with God. So here's the Word, and here's God. So how many, how many entities do we have here? Two. Now watch this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, do we have plurality? But we also have what? Singularity. Plurality and singularity. This is the very point that Jesus was making when He used the phrase, the, 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 the phrase that He so often used, Son of God. In fact, go to John chapter 5 and find out how the Jews related, the Jews of Jesus' day related to Jesus when He used that phrase. John chapter 5 verse 17. But Jesus answered them and said, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill Him, because He not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was His Father. Now look at this phrase here, making Himself, what does your Bible say? Equal with God. Okay, wait, 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 wait. In Jewish thinking here, as well as in, in modern thinking, um, my son is is he worth less than me? Is my son at my equal in terms, of essential, in terms of essence? Am I more of a human being than my son? No, 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 no. We're not equal in terms of authority for a time. He, he's under my supervision for a time. But, but the point is this. He is 100% a human being. I'm 100% a human being. So when Jesus said, I'm the son of God, my father is working, the Jews said, are you kidding how, can you, how could he say such a thing? When he calls himself the Son of God, he is making himself, what, what was the phrase? Equal. equal with God. Well, look, if you have, just and this is what we just saw in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, wonderful counselor, everlasting Father, mighty God. And so if the Father is God and the Son is God, how many entities do we have? We have two entities. Here's the Father, here's the Son, and they both are, they're both one. Just like in the beginning was the, and the Word was with, and the Word was, getting a feel for it here. Jesus says this, by the way, the Jews fully understand what He was saying, clearly understood what He was saying because they said, hey, you're making yourself equal with God. Now, when we get to John chapter 10, Jesus spells out this, this little uh, uh, formula, if I can use that language, absolutely explicitly, John chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus says, I and my Father are, there it is, I and my Father, entity, entity, are what? But in what sense are they one? Well, they're one in the Old Testament sense. They're one in the ikad sense, in the sense that they're unified. 
Not that, not that there's just a rigidly singular God. No, there is one God who is comprised of a kind of divine family. God as a society, God as a community, God as a fellowship of co-equal, co-eternal persons. Now, somebody's going to say, wait a minute, there's no Holy Spirit in these verses. True enough. We're going to get to the Holy Spirit in just a bit. But I want to be, maybe there's something I should just say here. In fact, we're going to spend most of our time in the Holy Spirit tomorrow night and the next three nights. We're still just sort of laying the, the groundwork here. But the point is basically this. What is hinted at in the Old Testament becomes increasingly clear in the New Testament, and then becomes expressly clear in the writings, for example, of Paul. What's hinted at in the Gospels, not even hinted at, what is spelled out increasingly clearly in the Gospels becomes just absolutely crystal clear by the time we get to the epistles of Paul. This is what is sometimes referred to as progressive revelation. And progressive revelation is just what it sounds like. What's the root word of revelation? reveal. So, progressive revelation would be a progressive revealing. You see a little bit here, and you can just think of a, of a tablecloth that covers, uh, you know, a, a long table. So, we just start peeling that cloth back, and it gets, it's clear there, and then it gets clear and clear and clear and clear, and as the whole thing begins to unfold, the, the picture begins to emerge that's very clear, very compelling. Okay? Are we together, everyone? Is this helpful at all? Are we learning anything? Now, there's just one more passage that I want to go to here tonight that I think will be good for us, and it's also a passage in John, and then we'll get into the epistles of Paul tomorrow night. Uh, this is John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Jesus here is having a discussion, you could almost call it an argument, with the religious leaders of His day. And in the context of the whole dialogue of, of John chapter 8, 8 verse 58, it has to do with descendancy, lineage, and fatherhood. And at one point, Jesus even goes so far as to say to them, you are of your father, the devil. I mean, that's like, that's not mincing words. That's strong medicine. You are of your father, the devil. Now, as this, as this begins to get to a real climax, pick it up in verse 48, the Jews answered and said, do we not correctly say that you are a Samaritan and you have a demon? I mean, they're just pulling out all the stops at this point. You're a Samaritan. It's like nanny, nanny, boo, boo, right? They were really upset. That was like the lowest insult. Well, as this dialogue continues to escalate, we pick it up in verse 56. Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. And the Jews said, are you kidding? You are not yet 50 years old. How have you seen Abraham? And then Jesus uttered some of the most phenomenally sublime words in all of the New Testament. He said, most assuredly, count on this, definitely, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's literally taking the phrase from Exodus chapter 3, when Moses stood at the burning bush, who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. And the, he the Hebrew word there is haya. It means to exist. That's what the word means. It's what we get the word Yahweh from. Haya, to exist. Yahweh. I am him who always is and always has been and always will be. I am that I am, the one who was and who is and who is to come. That's how it says in Revelation. We'll look at that tomorrow night. But Jesus there, speaking to the Jews, the Jewish leaders of his day, says, before Abraham was, I am. I am the Jehovah God of the Old Testament. In the very next verse, they pick up stones to stone him. Friends, this picture is emerging. God is a singularity, but also a plurality. Is it coming clear?